Three years ago, I published what is to date my most popular series. It looked at the emerging technology vertical farming, a technology some claimed was the future of agriculture, promising a more sustainable approach to growing high quality, healthy produce. And while many challenges remained, it certainly seemed like this technology was already an effective way to grow leafy greens and herbs, and even showed promise towards growing more challenging but impactful crop types in the future. But years on, how much has changed? Is vertical farming closer to realising its true potential, or has progress stagnated? As we'll see, this industry has not stood still since then, and neither has the whole world around us. Vertical farming is transitioning from cottage industry to a major new type of agriculture, with products sold on supermarket shelves and through online retailers. They're selling new types of crops that weren't possible even a few years ago, and we're seeing new types of farm, large and small, down to the size of vending machines, and perhaps even ones that can fit in the home. So plenty has happened over the last few years. But vertical farming isn't transforming the world just yet. It's still a tiny fraction of agriculture, and as we saw in the main series, to really impact our global challenges of climate, food, and water security, it's going to need to be able to grow energy-intensive crops like wheat and rice. So, what is the current state of vertical farming? How have the key technologies progressed over the last few years? How much closer is vertical farming to changing the world? When the Vertical Farming series was initially released in 2018, the size of the vertical farming market was $2.2 billion, with Japan making up a large percentage of the industry. However, as of last year, the global market has nearly doubled to $3.9 billion, an astonishing annual growth rate of 32%, with fast-growing markets all around the world. The industry's rapid growth has been supported by continued access to investment, with a recent global survey suggesting three quarters of farms looking for investment were able to obtain it. Over half of the financing comes from angel investors or family and friends. However, there's been a proliferation of new investment opportunities, from the emergence of dedicated ag tech venture capital, providing expertise and networks in addition to funding, to local development and environmental grants. There's even a rapidly growing crowdfunding equity model, which democratizes funding access across many small investors, holding promise in helping keep small operations get going. Access to finance is increasing the viability and scalability across many types of vertical farms. From large-scale plant factories to local community farms, investors large and small are keen to get involved in this industry. In the main series, we saw how 25% of Japanese vertical farms were profitable, 50% were breaking even, and 25% were losing money. That survey was from 2014. What's the picture today? Last year, a global survey found that of 128 vertical farms, 58% were profitable, 20% were breaking even, and 27% were making a loss. These are promising numbers, especially given the majority of farms losing money were less than a year old, with mature farms being significantly more profitable. This industry hasn't reached its ceiling yet. Technologies are evolving quickly, costs are falling, and despite the pandemic, its economic sustainability has only improved since the original videos. However, it's not just the size of the industry that's changed since those videos. There are some other updates and trends to be aware of. One of those, triggered by recent events, is a move towards remote working, resulting in an increased availability of low-cost offices and commercial spaces, particularly in urban areas. For smaller urban farms, it's an opportunity to move into prime locations, closer to the customer. It's not clear how this trend will sustain over the long term, but it is helping new urban farms get up and running for the near future at least. However, this availability of office space isn't likely to be enough to make skyscraper farms viable, and their business case remains hard to justify. 
In fact, the one and only Sky Farm we saw under construction in the main series has since ceased due to bankruptcy. Another trend impacting this industry is an increase in food as a delivery service, which is being leveraged by small community farms and even large-scale plant factories, with companies like Ocado moving to deliver freshly harvested produce. These trends are affecting farms at all scales, and the definition of what we might consider a vertical farm is also changing. The largest farms are getting bigger, but also the smallest farms are shrinking. InFarm is a leading example of this, having shrunk the vertical farming concept to the scale of vending machines. They can be placed in supermarkets, offices and restaurants, moving production directly to the point of consumption. This isn't likely to be a niche market either. To date, InFarm have distributed more than 500 units around the world and have received over $400 million in funding. But vertical farming can get even smaller. In fact, there are companies trying to bring this technology into the home. Growing at home isn't a new concept. It's been our primary method of agriculture since civilization began. However, over the last century, things have changed dramatically. And for most people, there simply isn't enough space to grow a meaningful amount of food at home. But what if your farm is the size of a washing machine and you have a year round supply of fresh salad and vegetables? This is the promise of vertical farming at home. Their controlled environment allows you to grow significantly more for a given area, enabling a surprising amount of food even in small spaces. While data for this new type of growing is limited, there's certainly interest for this technology, particularly amongst those looking to take more control in what they eat. The question is how viable these systems are in practice, and to what extent the grow at home market can scale. In the long term, the challenge for these systems is building an affordable product that delivers crop variety and enough growing density to pay back its cost in food savings. In the short term, it's about convincing early adopters that this technology can deliver quality that supermarkets can't match, whilst being convenient and easy to use. If you'd like me to explore this technology in more detail for a future video, let me know in the comments. Vertical farming is certainly progressing and promises new avenues for how we grow food. But as we saw in the main series, vertical farming's ability to positively impact the global challenges of climate, food and water security are severely limited by the types of food it can grow. While lettuce, herbs and other microgreens are certainly nutritious, they're a small fraction of our diets. Vertical farming will need to expand to the phase two crops of roots, fruits, vegetables and pulses. And to really have a major impact, energy intensive crops like rice, wheat and soy, which provide a substantial portion of global calories. The series showed how the energy efficiency of growing these crops was the primary barrier to cost effectively producing these crops, but also how progress in a number of key technologies was projected to help us significantly close that gap. So how are we progressing with developing those technologies? And are we making progress towards phase two and three? In those videos, it was suggested that we were on the verge of being able to produce phase two crops energy efficiently. So if that was the case, then we'd expect to find some farms to have already started trying to produce some of these crops by now. But is that actually the case? Well, yes. Over the past few years, there's been a number of plant factories who've been using 100% artificial light to grow and sell tomatoes and cucumbers, such as Riat from Russia, a US-based 80 acres. New Jersey's Aero Farms are also in the early phase of introducing blueberries, blackberries and raspberries, whilst New York's Bowery Farming are looking to expand into carrots and strawberries. Even though they're harder to produce than microgreens, the scale and adoption of phase two produce is increasing rapidly, with farms around the world adding these crops to their product lines. While they could be considered premium products in terms of quality, 
they're not necessarily limited to craft pricing, with firms like Plant Lab already selling tomatoes directly to supermarkets, three years earlier than predicted in the Vertical Farming series. But how is this possible? How has the viability of these more energy intensive crops improved so quickly? In the last three years, we've learned a lot more about growing food in controlled environments. And the level of research from the industry and academia is only increasing. Last year, Aero Farms announced their plans to build an 8,000 square meter facility in Abu Dhabi, dedicated to research and development for indoor agriculture, the largest of its kind in the world. And you could say this research is starting to bear fruit. In the vertical farming series, we identified a few key areas which showed tremendous potential in improving the energy efficiency of vertical farms. Technologies that were showing exponential improvements in cost and performance. Continued exponential progress in these areas are perhaps the best indicator that we're on track towards the most challenging and impactful crops. These three areas were LED efficacy, solar price performance, and yield increase. The series projected their improvement trajectory to ask when we might see the first example of phase three production with viable energy costs. The model predicted that it could potentially be achieved as soon as 2029, far sooner than many had been suggesting. But are we still on track with this projection? LED's efficacy, its lumens produced per watt, has increased 6.5% higher than modelled. But the real world improvement has been higher still. Lumens are a measure based on the sensitivity of the human eye and thus are weighted more towards green light. Conversely, grow lights are optimised for photosynthetically active radiation, which typically prioritises the blue and red wavelengths that have seen a greater than 6.5% improvement in efficacy. However, LED improvements haven't been limited to just efficacy. Our knowledge of the light recipes we talked about in earlier videos has improved dramatically, further boosting growth rate, yield, and energy efficiency. This is how Riat, the farm we saw before, is capable of growing 2.8 times more edible mass of tomatoes per photon than the 2014 experiment that was used as the basis of the main series phase two energy cost estimations. This progress is also part of the reason that many vertical farms growing phase one produce are now reporting labor as their primary expense and not electricity costs. And this trend is only likely to increase going forward. One of the key paths to improving phase three's viability was utilizing cheaper electricity and predicted solar would lead in making electricity cheaper with costs falling 66% from 2016 to 2021. So how far have we progressed? Surprisingly far. Solar has set many records as the cheapest source of electricity since then. In fact, it's actually improved much faster than modelled, with global average auction prices for solar falling at an astonishing 133% since 2016. Should such progress continue, it may enable the first viable Phase 3 production years earlier than predicted. But before we get ahead of ourselves, it's important to remember that solar still needs an associated improvement in energy storage technologies to realize its potential of cheap, usable energy. If you want to learn more about solar's potential as the cheapest source of energy and the challenges it faces, I've linked a previous video that looks at just that, and I'm planning a future video on energy storage. So consider subscribing if you want to be notified when that is posted. The projection that's harder to answer is yield, since there's limited new data for how much growing efficiencies have increased at the most advanced farms. While many smaller operations have improved their key energy metrics like edible mass percentage and cultivation rate, it's less clear if that's true for the farms that were already highly optimized and perhaps had less ceiling for improvement to work with. 
A deep dive into this topic could well be a topic of its own video, but for now, it's worth updating on what is perhaps the most important breakthrough for increasing the yield in plant factories. The main series highlighted developing indoor optimized seed as a critical requirement for dramatically improving the energy efficiency and thus affordability of phase two and particularly phase three crops. Well, this seed development is now well underway with companies like Bayer and Temasek creating new startups to develop new seed types specifically optimized for indoor growing. However, the most important demonstration of this technology came at the end of 2019, when a research team published a paper on the use of CRISPR for producing bunched tomatoes. Tomatoes are typically grown on long vines. However, these bunched tomatoes have over twice the fruit density by volume, requiring much less space and making harvesting easier. More importantly, greatly reducing growth of inedible vines brings tomatoes much closer to the 95% edible mass of lettuce, greatly increasing the energy efficiency and growing speed. Whether CRISPR, conventional breeding, or a mixture of the two, developing indoor optimized seed is likely paramount to making the difficult crops of phase three possible, and progress in this area is accelerating. Without good data on progress in plant factories yield increases, it's hard to give an update to an exact date of when phase three production might become economically energy efficient. But it's clear that tremendous progress has been made in many of the key areas needed to make it a reality. And with many technologies ahead of schedule, it may even arrive a few years earlier than expected. However, many barriers still need to be overcome for vertical farming to really live up to its potential. Even with the rapid progress we've seen, vertical farming still has a long road ahead of itself to become a key part of agriculture and have a significant impact on our global challenges. Still, the progress we are seeing now is crucial to its future success. The viability and scalability of phase one has not only solidified, it's laid the groundwork for future vertical farms. Whether that future is growing at huge scale in highly optimized plant factories, growing close to the communities that consume them, or even growing inside a restaurant or at home. The last few years have brought vertical farming to the next step, where food beyond leafy greens and herbs are being grown across the globe and a step closer towards a world where vertical farming is capable of delivering the impact that many hoped it would. If you're interested in learning how to grow yourself, but don't know where to start, then a great way to start that journey is through this video's sponsor, Skillshare, with their excellent class, Gardening 101, a guide for growing and caring for plants by Geraldine Levin, which guides you step-by-step -step through the process of planning, planting, and maintaining your garden and additional basic concepts that will help you along the way. If you're thinking about getting started in vertical farming, then the lessons on propagation are particularly relevant, and you will also learn how you can harvest, dry, and store your own herbs. And you explore topics like this and many more through this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is a community and platform that's built to help you explore your interests, learn valuable insights, improve yourself, or perhaps create something new. It has a huge range of classes on many topics, from creative writing and music production to marketing and entrepreneurship, and new premium classes are being added all the time. Topics are curated to help you find just what you're looking for, and the classes are designed around learning with no distractions or ads. There's even great classes on topics we saw in this video, such as growing your own tomatoes, learning about solar energy, or even creating your own LED projects. If you'd like to try out these classes or some of the many others like them on Skillshare, then click the link below. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today.